Coming up on today's Locked On Senators, we're starting our exit interview series, and where else would we start than in between the pipes? We're going to take a look at the seasons of Anton Forsberg, Mad Sogart, and Cam Talbot, and what we can expect from them next. And I had boots on the ground in Winnipeg playoff action, plus it could be worst case Ontario elsewhere. All of it's brought to you by the Game Time app. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On NHL for twenty dollars off your first ticket purchase. I used it yesterday. Great stuff. Locked On NHL gets you twenty dollars off your first ticket purchase at Game Time. This is the Locked On Senators podcast. It's your team every day. Your Locked On Senators, your daily podcast on the Ottawa Senators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm Jake Sanderson, and you're listening to Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Tim Stützle, and you're listening to the Locked On Senators Podcast. Welcome inside episode 785 of the Locked On Senators Podcast. I'm Ross Levitan on the outskirts of enemy territory in Winnipeg, Manitoba. Alongside Brandon Pillar up in the Blue Mountains, please like and subscribe on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. And if you're watching, leave a comment below. Who was the best goalie you saw for the Ottawa Senators this year? And is Matt Sogard still the goalie of the future? Today is Tuesday, April 25th, and Pillsy will get to all that But last night just simply sucked in the National Hockey League playoffs. Yeah, I mean, depending on who you're a fan of, it certainly wasn't a good night for any of the teams I picked. I'll tell you that for free. But, Ross, I'm starting to feel like the whiteout in Winnipeg may need some tweaking. As uh, I'll hand it off to you, but you tweeted out the stats of how the whiteout has gone recently. Not good. No, not good would be an improvement, I'd say. They've lost seven in a row and have gone one and nine in the last 10 whiteouts. Now, you might say, hey, they made it to the second round in 2021. Yeah, no fans, no whiteout. Okay, in the building, whiteout. We're going back to round two of their series. Sorry, round three, their game one of round three against Vegas. They lose game two. They lose game five. They lose Every home playoff game in 2019, all three of them, to the Stanley Cup champion, St. Louis Blues, in the first round, albeit. And then this year, they go 0 for 2. Now, they battle back twice. Not enough. Not enough. Not enough. And they battle back from some injuries, too. And again, no excuses. It's playoffs. But when you lose your top guys early in the game, that's a lot of extra minutes that have to go around. So it was a minute 14 of of Josh Morrissey on, on Saturday in a double overtime game. Yeah. And then Mark Shifley played two shifts, went hard into the boards after a breakaway. And you just think that puck goes in the net. We could be looking at a different game. That would have made it 2 nothing or one nothing, And then they scored next after. So, yeah, the Jets are dead. The whiteout's dead. But, man, it's a cool experience. It definitely is like one of those sporting things that I'm trying to think of others that you have to get to. Like the Masters is one, obviously. Like just the ones that have the prestige about it. And. Obviously, Winnipeg gets a, the whatever rep it will, but man, they, they come out for the whiteouts. It's super cool, and you almost need to wear sunglasses when you walk in, Pilsy. Game, <laughs> the first game I go down, you get in, and everyone's not only wearing white but waving white towels. It's like it's very bright. It's it's wild. Yeah, well, I'm glad you were able to go to the very last whiteout that will be happening in Winnipeg Jets history as uh, Ross. We're wearing black for game six. <laughs> well, the funeral vibes? Uh-oh, maybe not the right move there. But I mentioned to you, they got to rebrand it as the blue out. Get everybody wearing blue. It's got to be the blue out now because the, the home team doesn't wear white anymore. We got to get with the times here. Or, I mean, petition to the NHL if because they definitely market the white out, right? Yeah. Let them wear white at home. Honestly, yeah. That No, actually, that might be the, the play there. Yeah. Vegas gets to wear their gold jerseys at home for the playoffs. <laughs> I guess you have to pick one and one. The NHL so boring. Like the NBA, you wear different jerseys every night, it feels like. Well, I guess the only problem with that, Ross, is then now you're committing to wearing white for every single game because you'd be wearing white on the road as well, which isn't the worst thing. But you better love that jersey if you're going to wear it every single playoff game. Yeah, that's actually a really good point. Hmm. 
Maybe the, maybe the, one of them like wear the throw, wear the throwbacks on the road. Ooh, no, I would wear the throwbacks at home. Mm, there you go. Yeah. Glory days. That's the play. Yeah. 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 Dylan DeMello is so good. He tried his best Mark uh, Mathod impression last night. He got called though. It was a trip. He tried tried to go for the hip check. Oh he, yeah. Leg a little low. I didn't think it was a penalty, but they gave him one. But Mark Mathot would have been proud of that one. I thought you were going to say uh, overtime game winner in the playoffs as is Mark Mathot, uh <laughs> honor. No, no overtime. Thank God. 830 local time start. Don't need OT. Speaking of OT, though. No. My God. Ross, I <laughs> – it was 4-1. Yep. And I said to myself, this game's over. I'm, I don't need to watch the Lightning close out the Leafs in this one. I'll turn over to the Jets game. I was messaging my brothers about it, and they're like, what do you mean the game's over? It's tied 4-4. I was like, what? Get to overtime. And, I mean, that's probably – that's the only way you're going to beat Vasilevsky is from a far shot like Morgan Riley did that he screened or a tip like Kerfit uh, did in the last game here. So two back-to-back -back games going to overtime, and the Leafs take both of them. 3-1 in the series now i don't know if you know but uh, the leafs do have a reputation of choking in the playoffs so i'm not i'm not concerned well no i am a little bit concerned gonna gonna be honest but this is not over like if it was any other team other than the tampa bay lightning maybe it's over but we've seen this story before at least something similar the uh, toronto maple leafs i believe oh and nine when they have a chance to close out a series in the Matthews Marner era. Yep. The, or sorry, let's, they're 0 and 10. 0 let's and 10. see them go 0 for 13 then. So they could go 1 and 12 and still get out of the first round. Yeah. Got to play the games, but this Lightning team not only looks like they're going to take a step back right now and kind of like burnt out, fair enough, three fair. straight finals. But my goodness, does this kind of open the door for next year? Like, is this team. They're still pretty nasty, but like at some point, you Kucherov's played like 160 playoff games. He's been in the league for eight years. <laughs> yeah, it's insane. And then, well, look at Vasilevsky, like a goalie that young. What he's the the miles that he's put on and goalie miles. It's like it's like dog years. You got to add a, a couple multipliers on there on those fun. hips, on those knees. Like my God, how many playoff games do you think Vasilevsky's played in? Can you tell me how many see how many years in the playoffs he's been in? No, I'm still trying to find it myself. That's oh, okay. So a little, tri little trick of the trade. Ask a question when you're trying to find the answer yourself. Little, I, I reverse you know that on you though. I was trying to think of it myself, so I gave you a question to buffer. Um, if I had to guess, he's probably been in the playoffs eight times. Correct. Man, I'm I'm smart. Oh boy. Funny. Okay, eight times he's been to the Cup Finals three straight times. So that's at least. And, and his backups don't 16. even bring their gear to the games. Hey, Brian Elliott, Curtis McElhaney, they don't even bring their gear. Yeah, they just make sure their ring size is proper. <laughs> um, you know what? I'm going to go with 79. More. 93. More. In the hundos? 108 games in the playoffs for fast. Ooh, oh, yeah, 79. That was low. He's only played 425 regular season games. This guy's played a quarter of the amount of playoff games. It's wow. Insane. It's incredible. It's incredible. It is incredible. And and great run for Tampa. Hey, it's the first. Of, this is what the Jets tweeted out after the game, too. Oh, no. It's the first to four, not the first to three. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> they've already tied their shoes. They already put their jacket on. They're just they're not going out the door just yet. Yeah, exactly. Oh man, and then I uh, I don't want to talk about this Leaf series anymore. No, uh, it stinks. How about the Seattle Kraken? My God, you got to give it to that team. They're proving a lot of people wrong with that big overtime win at home, nonetheless. And Kale McCarr might be getting suspended for a hit on Jared McCann. Now Jared McCann also likely out which is unfortunate um i think one game would be fine but i don't think it's a very brutal hit by by league stand we've seen worse this playoffs let's put it exactly. that way yep but that would just be a huge hole to fill for the colorado avalanche if kale mccarr's out for any time due to a suspension i played 27 minutes last night he's obviously the best defenseman in the league so 
I'm curious to see what comes out of that. But yeah, give the Kraken credit. We knew they'd win one at home. Billsy, it was game one, I think, that shocked me where they got yep. out to an early series lead. But um, I mean, I still got Colorado, but at the same time, you just have to tip your hat. Jordan Eberle in overtime, Mr. Clutch, Captain Can not Captain Canada, but man, was he unreal at the World Juniors, obviously, in Ottawa. What, what was his nickname? Didn't they call him the Messiah or something like that? It was something, uh, or like it was some sort of uh, religious savior type nickname. Well, he's going to have to score a couple bigger goals than the one in, in game four. It's a big goal. They, uh, they need more more uh, magic from the gods if they're going to come back and, and actually win this series against the defending Stanley Cup champs. Tied up at two, though. Not bad. Yeah. And, hey, speaking of tied up at two, that uh, New Jersey-New York series, that is not the way I thought this was going to go. Who had Akira Schmid as the X factor in this one? My God, he won't let in anything. Yeah, and the New York Rangers, like it's so weird that they've they've swapped road wins. Like I thought the Rangers, after getting two on the road, then going back to Madison Square Garden, like all right, this is going to be a nice, clean, tidy sweep. But the Devils, they had something to say about that. Yeah, I've been so bad at picking this postseason. Oh, it's been tough. The last couple days have been tough on me as well. Yeah, yeah. So we've got the Boston Bruins, the Toronto Maple Leafs, the Carolina Hurricanes, and the Vegas Golden Knights, all with 3-1 series leads. The series that are still tied, New Jersey, New York at 2, Colorado, Seattle at 2, Dallas, Minnesota at 2, and Edmonton, L.A. at 2. Pilsy, last thing about last night's game in, in Winnipeg. I thought this was a pretty creative chant. Did you hear it on TV? They were chanting after they scored the second goal and were really pushing. You're a backup at Laurent <laughs> Brassois. Yeah, that is a good chant, but when he goes and gets the win. Yeah. I mean, they didn't really test him. He, Yeah, fair. That's probably my biggest qualm of the series so far, is that was the one Achilles heel of this yep. Vegas Golden Knights team. And by the way, like Mark Stone might be the worst skater in the league, but he just gets it done. It's crazy. Like he labors around the ice, and the next thing you know, he's got two points. Yeah, it's the hockey IQ. It's something that if you're a Sens fan and you watched him, you knew that was that's his A game right there. Unreal. But yeah, Laurent Bossois, I mean, 24 saves, whatever. Whatever. Zero even strength goals for, for Winnipeg. Anyways, they're dead. They're gone. It's time. Yeah. And uh, Pilsy's parlay of the day remains stinky as uh, Hellebuck didn't even get his 27 and a half saves. He got 26 and the Jets, of course, <laughs> did not win. Just completely mushed. All right. That's your playoff roundup. We're going to do that for the first round. We're, we're hockey guys. We like yeah. chatting hockey, but if you want to get to the Sens content, that's coming up next. We got goaltending season in review and what's next. This is the start of our exit interview season, Pilsy. So for the next number of days, we're going to keep, Right first thing in the morning, we're going to tweet out asking you to give a fan grade for each of the players we're going to discuss that day. So get your votes in early. We'll leave those up for about an hour, hour and a half, and then we'll take those immediate results, put them into the chart, and we've got a nice visual for you guys here as I am becoming a graphics master. My goodness. But that's all coming up next. You're listening to Locked On Senators. Today's episode is brought to you by our friends over at Game Time. They're the presenting sponsor of this episode, and I love Game Time because I don't like to stress, Ross. I'm not a big planner. I'm a spontaneous guy, think in the moment, and that's why Game Time makes it easy for you to get last-minute tickets because they have the best deals, and you can find them fast and easy, not just for sports games, though, guys. Concerts, comedy, theater, Anything you want, you can find it on Game Time. So forget planning months in advance. Game Time has deals right up to the day of the event. You can get exclusive, exclusive flash deals for all the sports, football, basketball, hockey, baseball, and like I mentioned, all entertainment events. And Game Time guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same row and same section for less, Game Time will credit you 110% the difference. And this is something Ross loves. You can look at your seats and you get a view of where you're sitting and how it looks so you know what to expect when you show up to the game. Buy tickets in a matter of seconds. Just two taps, one, two, and boom, you've got your tickets. No need to go through your email. No need to get the old printer out and worry about, do I have enough ink? Do I have enough paper? No, get that out of here. Game time makes it easy. Download the Game Time app. 
Create an account and use code locked on NHL. You're going to get yourself 20 bucks off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account, redeem code locked on NHL for 20 bucks off. Game time today. Last minute tickets, last minute lowest price, and it's all guaranteed. Today's episode is also brought to you by Shawarma Palace. You know how much I love Shawarma Palace. Pilsy and I make sure that every time we go to Ottawa, it's our first stop, and for good reason, too. Not only is it like stopping at the gas station, you're fueling up with amazing fresh food, but also the portion size is unreal. Like you're never leaving Shawarma Palace with anything but a full belly and a happy heart because Shawarma Palace uses only the freshest ingredients in their salads. The turnips that I love on my wrap, you know, they've got the garlic sauce, homemade fresh. You can get the spicy garlic if you want. You can get crazy at Shawarma Palace. You can get the wrap. You can get the platter. You can get lots of great food. You know, I love the baklava, right? You know, Pelsy knows me. And the baklava. 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 You're baklava. close there. Close oh, there. I'm getting so close. But you know what? I'm never close enough to eat as many as I want. I got to hold off. You can't have too many in one sitting. But, man, they make them just great at Chihuahua and Palace. Go check them out at any of their nine locations. And if you're feeling lazy, you're feeling chill, Relax at home and just open your phone. Uber Eats is the exclusive delivery partner of Shawarma Palace. So go check them out, Shawarma Palace. Let them know that Locked On Senators sent you. You can find them on Bank Street, Rideau Street. You're never too far from a Shawarma Palace. So fill up, eat like a king, eat like a royal at Shawarma Palace. All right, Pilsy. Oh, too bad. I'm rocking the 67s hat today. Unfortunately, their season over. Second round playoff exit for the 67s. And it sucked because they loaded up a little bit here at oh, the yeah. deadline and they couldn't get it done. They could not get it done. A third round exit, actually. They made it to the third round. Peterborough gets the uh, 5-4 win and it's all over. Yeah, that's tough, especially Ross. I- I'm not saying it would have been um, completely different, but you get a guy like Tyler Boucher in the lineup for the playoffs. He's someone that's built to go up against another team in seven-game series and be an agitator, score some goals as well. And they don't get any of that, uh, unfortunately, with his shoulder injury. So yeah. sucks for the 67s because th- this was a magical year for them, a regular season for the ages. Yeah, and – you know what? Let's let's uh, remember that I can't read very well. Um, the P, it's the highlight here says leads Pete's to the Eastern Conference Final. So I was right; it was second round uh, matchup there, oh, yeah. bro, and Ottawa. Unfortunate, but uh, yeah, hopefully Bush is back playing pro hockey next year with the Belleville Senators. Uh, unless, I mean, he could go down as an overager, but he it, the physicality. I think he's just gonna get himself into trouble going up against 16 year olds as a, uh, as a 19 turning 20 year old here um, for Tyler Boucher, of course, recovering from his shoulder injury, no games for him in the second half of the season. And it felt like none of these goalies really had a chance at an extended period of time because they were either hurt, they were sick or just simply not stopping pucks enough this year. And obviously when you go into the season, you're hoping for that high save percentage. What did DJ Smith say or Pierre Dorian? I think he said they wanted their team save percentage. 918. 918. I mean, come on. Like that, that was pretty high to begin with. I think 914, 913 could have been pretty Anything good. Anything above 9, like 910, I think is the sweet spot you want, right? Well, the Ottawa Senators had the 24th best save percentage in the NHL at five on five. At even strength, only seven, eight teams had less saves than the Ottawa Senators. But individually, how did their seasons go? All right, checking in on Cam Talbot and how his season went with the Ottawa Senators. We already know, confirmed by Pierre Doria, he will not be back. So with that said, we know that it's a one and done for Cam Talbot in the nation's capital. Pilsy, how would you summarize his stay? Disappointing. I mean, I think that's what every Sens fan would agree to. I know we're going to try not to mention this too many times, but when you look at the one-for-one one trade and you look at how that went for Gustafson in the wild, I don't care. You can be like, oh, that doesn't matter. You just have to look at how he did in Ottawa. No, it is a factor when it's that big of a deal. If Gus went over there and had 
a decent season or maybe still wasn't ready for a backup role or whatever, then who cares? But he went over there and he dominated. Like, he's in Vesna conversations. Will he win it? No, definitely not. But he was that good of a goalie that he basically willed the Minnesota Wild uh, to a good spot in the playoffs. And Cam Talbot was supposed to be a stable veteran that kind of helped throw off the balance of all these goalie problems the Ottawa Senators have. He was supposed to be either a 1A or a 1B with Anton Forsberg. And unfortunately, a guy in his mid to late 30s, he started off with a rib injury. We didn't get to see him for quite a while. Forsberg and Sogard had to hold down the fort. Then he did come back. He played in a couple really good games. Like There's a couple games where he did get the win for the Ottawa Senators, but Ross... Unfortunately, in my mind, there are way more stinkers where he ends up getting pulled. And I mean, you were a witness of one of them in Winnipeg and he just wasn't able to be consistent throughout. And then after that period, he gets hurt again, unfortunately. And then he comes back at the end of the season. The games actually matter at this point. Excuse me. And um, it's a point where you're like, okay, this is why we brought Cam Talbot in. Last season, he finished the year, what, Ross? Like 16-1-1 or something insane like that. So, hey, we got Talbot in here for a last season uh, push. He's going to do the same, hopefully, for us. And that was not the case. But he kind of did. I mean, he didn't stop the puck. He had an 877 save percentage in his last 11 games. But somehow, someway, he went 7-2-1 and one in those games. Like, I, I don't understand yeah. He was still able to get wins down the stretch, even though that save percentage was near, near if not the bottom of the league over that stretch. He just really had trouble stringing together solid performances. The best he did was in December, where he had, I mean, a couple of them were maybe some hand-picked opponents. There was that Wade Redden shutout game where Wade Redden was put in the ring of honor against Anaheim, had a 32-save shutout there, then got wins over Montreal and Detroit. He won four games in a row. And he played really well over that stretch. But then, yeah, the Winnipeg game was right after. Five goals on 24 shots. And it really just felt like almost a bit of Matt Murray syndrome where it was one great game, one bad game, one great game, one bad game, then get hurt. And then it was this. It was more like two or three really good games. You feel like you're getting on a roll, then clunk. Then it would be one, two, three games where you're like, what is going on? The one that stands out like a sore thumb, the New Year's game, right? New Year's Eve where he lets yep. it four against Detroit, including where he put he put a pass right on the tape of the Detroit four-checker, and he, he scores what ended up being the game winner. Like, there were just some, some mistakes that I think Cam Talbot would tell you, and he did so much in his exit interview with the Sens, where it's like, man, that was, that was brutal. Like, I, I don't know what happened. Like, this is not what my standard is as an NHL goalie. So Cam Talbot finishes with 36 games, 17 wins, a 293 goals against, an 898 save percentage. Now, goal saved above expected is an analytic we're going to use for the three goalies. That is based on the league average save percentage on any given day. Are you going to be higher or lower than that? And Cam Talbot was a minus 5.5 on the goal saved above expected. The fans were harsh on him too. We put up the poll on Twitter at Send Central. The fans, 53.8% the majority, put a D grade for Cam Talbot. And I only put A, B, C, D, four options. So we had some people even write in F. They had high, high hopes for him, right? He was yep. the veteran. He was the stabilizer. And mm -hmm. he did not stabilize, unfortunately, in the crease for Ottawa this year. Yeah, Ross, if I could give him a, a fan grade uh, myself, I would give him a C minus just because – I do think as a goalie, especially an older goalie, when you get injuries, it throws off your balance and it's tough to make your way back into a routine and kind of get to where you want to be. But ultimately, he just he wasn't able to be that guy. And I'm looking at his game logs and it, it is interesting, like you mentioned, like, sure, the numbers are terrible, but his record down the stretch was pretty good. Like he had a four game win streak from February 27th. So that Detroit uh kind of back-to-back -back games, and then up against Philly on March 30th. Now, obviously, there's an injury uh, in there for sure, but he goes 4-0 with a save percentage of 875 in that stretch. Like, he's getting a couple wins, but it's not like he's the reason they're winning these games. That was the Ottawa Senators offense that was really clicking off here. So, 
it's so disappointing that he wasn't able to be the guy the Sens needed. Because really, in my mind, Ross, they just need a stopgap guy to bridge the gap between Sogard being ready. And obviously, we'll get more into Sogard. But it seemed like Talbot, if he came in on the one year and had a really nice year, maybe you extend him for one more year. We had an episode extend Cam Talbot. And uh, that aged pretty quickly as we changed our minds within about two weeks of that episode dropping. So... It didn't, it didn't work out. And I think if anyone's sitting here being like, I knew at the time that was a terrible trade and Dorian messed that up, like, I don't know. I feel like most people saw what the team was trying to do and recognized that Philip Gustafson wasn't going to work out in Ottawa. Who knows if he would work somewhere else, but it seemed clear it wasn't going to work here. At least he wasn't ready right now to do what they needed. And Cam Talbot seemed like a good answer, especially coming off that hot at, uh, end of the season there. So it's tough. It is tough, and I hope he finds another gig. I hope he bounces back. It's definitely not the way the 35, soon-to-be 36-year-old will want to end his career. That's been solid, man. He came up from an undrafted player to a guy who's played 432 NHL games, but not going to be in Ottawa, and I think it's best for both parties here to move on. Now, that's Cam Talbot's season. In a nutshell, it finishes off just disappointing. Disappointing overall. It really is. This is the first time in four years that Cam Talbot's have had a goal saved above expected below the zero mark. So really unfortunate. They didn't get the Cam Talbot they wanted, nor did they get the Cam Talbot they needed. And uh, they're going to have to look for a new alternative in between the pipes for next season. All right, coming up next on Locked On Senators, we will get into Mad Sogard. We'll get into Anton Forsberg and a whole lot more. You're listening to Locked On Senators. All right, Pilsy. Just want to give people a reminder. You can follow the show on Twitter, at Send Central. You can follow the show on Instagram, Locked On Dot senators we're also available wherever you download your podcast whether it's spotify you can follow the show and give it five stars there you can leave a review on apple Podcasts. give us a zoom like nick spence's jersey i don't know if anybody saw do you see that with the yeah. 55 views on it it's good it's good it uh it, it plays it definitely plays shout out nick for that one we've got um on instagram locked on dot senators and please subscribe on youtube it does help a lot with the algorithm here especially now that we're in to the off season if you missed any of our interviews of the last week you can go find them we have ian mendez on we had david foot on we had mark Mathot on twice, twice. yeah <laughs> and now we've got two more goalies to get to pilsy anton forsberg Ooh. Came into this season after an astonishing last year. He was awesome. He really was. He was the he became a 1A, 1B tandem type goalie from a waiver pickup, a pretty quick turnaround. But unfortunately, his season ended way too early. That game against Edmonton tears both his MCLs, misses the last two plus months of the season. And what really, really sucked about that one, aside from a serious injury that we never wish upon anyone, but he was really starting to find his game after a slow start. Yeah, he was. And uh, I'm looking at his game log here, Ross, and the last, let's see, five games of the season, he went three and one, obviously didn't finish that game in Edmonton, um, and had a 914 save percentage and even uh, tossed a shutout in there up against Montreal. Like he was looking like the guy the Ottawa Senators needed him to be, which was great because at the start of the year, he was holding down the fort for Cam Talbot. And it just, it seemed like it was too much for him, right? Like I don't think anyone really thought Anton Forsberg was a starter. I think. At least I'll speak for myself. I thought he was a good 1B goalie option. And he needed a guy like Cam Talbot that could be a 1A for him. Or at least they could go back and forth between being the A guy. And, I mean, it's it's tough for Forsberg because this was a guy the Ottawa Senators picked up on, on waivers. He ends up being a really great fit. They sign him to a good deal. He finally has stability. He finally has a chance to kind of make his mark here. And then it's got a dark cloud over it with that massive, massive injury. 
Oh, it's just so, so tough to watch. The, just the body kind of contort over itself. And, you know, with with your foot against your post, or he was in the reverse VH, right? So you have that post jammed up against your skate, and there's no give. Like, your leg is moving with that weight on you. There's nothing you can do to stop it. So, unfortunately, um, unfortunately, missed the end of the season. But, fortunately, he's already back skating without gear, and, and he'll be ready for training camp. He still played 28 games, though, and that speaks to you mentioning off the top. They just ran with him right out of the gate. And, again, the best avail- ability is availability, and Cam Talbot just simply didn't have that this year, where Anton Forsberg had to step in, play 28 games. He had 11 wins, which probably y- you don't love. 11 wins, 11 losses, two ties. Air two overtime losses ties. Wow. I, I need it. Like the Leafs win three games in a series all, automatically. I'm shuttled back to 2004 for a minute. <laughs> please, please spare me. But with Anton Forsberg, a 3.26 goals against average, a 902 save percentage, and a minus 1.8 goals saved above expected. And that's a stat that Forsberg dominated in last year. Yeah. He was plus 14.5 last Ooh. year. Chelsea goes down to minus 1.8. Now, he's still signed for two more years. So we're still going to have lots more Anton Forsberg. He'll be he'll be one of the goalies next year. The fans were split on him. This is the closest fan vote that we've had. C gets the slight edge, 48.4%. But people were giving him Bs as well. He had the two shutouts for the Ottawa Senators. So I, I do see a merit. With giving him like a B minus would probably be where I where I land on Anton Forsberg. I got him at a C plus Ross just because I do take into account the injury. That's uh, it's tough for him to really get a full uh, season survey here. But what I'm looking at Ross, his game logs here from November 27th all the way to December 18th. That's a 12 game sample size, and his record was two six and two. Now obviously there's some games and relief and, and things like that in there, but a two, six and two record in that stretch. It, it was tough. And he just, he wasn't able to battle the way that he did in previous years, Ross, at least that's what it seemed like to me. Like sometimes he would get in there and he would have a nice game, but there was periods like there's that sequence, uh, not last season, but the season before where he made like six amazing saves against Detroit in overtime. Do you remember that game later on in the previous season? And he's just battling. Like he doesn't care that these games mean nothing. He needs that contract. He needs that stability for his family. He's trying to boost his numbers and he was able to do that. Now I'm not saying that he got uh, uh, lazy with his signed contract. That's not at all what I'm saying. I'm just saying it didn't seem like he was out there uh, able to kind of, mop everything up when the Sens weren't able to clean things up or made mistakes before it seemed like he was able to do that this season it just I I didn't get that feeling I didn't like before when Forsberg was in net I was confident I was confident I felt like other Sens fans were confident I felt the players were confident I felt DJ Smith was confident in Forsberg which is something that DJ is not a goalie guy but he didn't have that same shine this year no I think that's a fair way to put it so what do you expect from him next year then I, I'm maintaining my position on Forsberg. For this team to have success, he needs to be your one B goalie, or at the, or maybe even a backup. Like he cannot be your main guy. But if he's a backup, you better have brought in a, a damn good goalie to demote him down to that because he's going to be fighting for those uh, starts. And his contract is a little higher than most backups are. Um, I'm expecting him to play. You know. 35 games, hopefully closer to closer to 40, try to split with another goalie. And all we need is we got to bump that save percentage up here. What, what was he at? A 902, I think. Yeah. I, I need Forsberg to be at a 910. I like it. He needs to be able to come in and not just play back to backs, but have a couple stretches where he strings long wins and where he shows this team that, hey, you got me signed for a couple more years here and it's going to fit into your, to our plans here. Cause basically in my mind, when Forsberg's contract runs out, likely the Sens will move on from him. Cause Mad Sogard will be ready to either take over his one B role or something uh, a little more expansive than that. 
37th in save percentage league-wide this year, Anton Forsberg. His 11 wins were 46, but again, he didn't get to play the full year, so take that one with a grain of salt. But I, what I found interesting is that Pierre Dorian wants to get him into Ottawa earlier this summer. He said that he's a hard worker, but he wants him to show up in the shape that he finishes the season in. So he wants him to come a little bit earlier. We'll see how that affects Anton Forsberg's next season with the Ottawa Senators. Leave us a comment below. Let us know what your expectations are. Because for me, it's a little bit tough when you're coming off two major knee injuries. And we'll see how he's able to battle back. But a very well-liked guy in the room. The next guy we're going to discuss gave us the insight on that last time we had Mad Sogard on. Just how liked. Anton Forsberg is in the community as well. He's the kind of guy who would go to a pride parade, really show his face in the community and try to do the right things. And when it comes to his on ice performance, you know, he can battle. You got two of the Sens three shutouts this year, but you want to see a little more consistency, especially for a guy who isn't going to get the leeway of being your one, one, one. I'm going to play all the time. You need to make those spot starts really matter. So you can string together a four or five game win streak as he's done in the past. All right, now discussing Mad Sogard. His season was wild. You look at a guy who started out in the American League, probably would have liked a little more success down there. He comes up to the NHL and doesn't get sent back, Pilsy. He was up here for the last two-plus months of the season. He was up here at the start of the season when Cam Talbot went out. Like Just the, the lack of availability for both Talbot and Forsberg put the 22-year-old in a very tough circumstance. He ends up playing 19 NHL games this year, 22 in the minors. Like This guy, complete, basically 50-50 split. How would you summarize his first full uh, NHL season? Well, the thing I need to start with, and you mentioned it there, but I'll just expand on it a little, is I don't think this is the position Mad Sogard thought he would be in playing this many games, especially not going back down to, to Belleville, really. And I don't think this is the position the Ottawa Senators management wanted to put him in. So he was put in a spot that no one was prepared for. So I, I want to start everything with saying that. And the reason I... I'm so focused on that is these were, Ross, you'll remember more than anyone, these were my exact concerns with Philip Gustafson. I see the talent there. I, I see that he can be a guy that eventually could become a really good NHL goalie. But the development for goalies is so important because, Ross, you know, we're nutcases upstairs. Like if anything goes wrong up here, if the confidence starts shaking or you, you start saying, oh, I thought I was ready for the NHL, maybe I'm not. And you start overthinking things. You get away from your game. And as uh, Pete Fry, uh, the goalie mental skill coach we talked to, would probably tell you, you need to stay in your own lane. And you need to be sure of what you're able to do, regardless of whether you're playing ECHL, AHL, or NHL. You need to know your own game. And I thought that sometimes Sogard put a little too much pressure on himself. We saw after big losses, he was telling the media, this one's on me. I got to be better, etc. Which isn't far from the truth, but it's high expectations for a young goalie just thrown into the NHL. And that's where you really see the leadership of Brady Kachuk kind of shaking his head being like, he said that to you guys, like I, I got to talk to him. This was, this is not on him. This is on the players. And, and then going out with that bold statement, he's the goalie of the future. He's going to be lifting the cup with us one day. Like, or I'm paraphrasing there, but what a statement for Brady Kachuk to say. And, I'll just kind of wrap up this little uh, rant here. Ross was saying, I still am of the belief that Mad Sogard is the goalie of the future for the Ottawa Senators. Mad Sogard season included 19 games, eight wins, a 332 goals against average, and an 889 save percentage. His goal saved above expected, minus 7.8. And when you're looking league-wide, it's, it's near the bottom for sure. And Mad Sogard has one year left on his entry-level contract. I was a little surprised the fan grade is a B, overwhelmingly, 64.5%. I think a lot of people, if, if given a chance to explain, would say, man, just a completely unfair situation yep. to Matt Sogard being thrown. And not only thrown into the fire, because we saw him come in right away and do well. Rookie of the month in the National yeah. Hawks League in February. He went 4-0-1 with a 922 save percentage including our boots on the ground overtime loss. But all that to say, this is the National League for a reason. It's mental fortitude. It's being able to go day in, 
day out, game on, game off, game on. It's a never-ending schedule, and that's the part of the mental grind that you need experience. When they talk about experience, it's not making sure that your, your body's mature for the physicality. It's making sure that you can handle going as often as they do, especially when both goalies were out, so they had no one else to lean on but yeah. Matt Bogart. This Mads guy, was the veteran guy for a stretch here. This guy, he was a veteran guy when he had his like, fifth NHL game when Mando was backing him up. They had a combined five NHL games. <laughs> yeah, it was crazy. Like, like that's that's a tough spot to be put in when, when you're just getting trotted out, whether it's a bad game, good game, you're going out next. Like Perfect example is that Chicago game. Sorry to bring it up, Pilsy. Uh, but he lets in five on 21. Not great. Well, he's right back in next game. He's able to get the win, but that was probably the stretch where the season was kind of lost, right? You look at the same percentage on that trip out West was, was not ideal. Like we don't have to go game by game through it, but it was less than ideal. I'm glad he got some good games under his belt at the end of the season. So hopefully he can feel good about that. Like that game he lost against Boston was not his fault. Two goals on 35 shots. Then he gets wins against Tampa, against Florida. Yep. I mean, a couple of games he probably wants a few back. The Toronto game where he let in three on 16. And um, and then he's able to kind of get the win against Carolina in the last home game of the season uh, to look good there. So I, I still have a ton of confidence in Matt Sogard. The physical skills are undeniable. Six foot seven. He's filling out his frame. Obviously, he had a few great games, and if you, I think, if I were to sum up his season, Pilsy, in one sentence, big games, bad goals. Yep, and that's fair. And there was a stretch there, especially on that road trip that you referenced, where I remember uh, me, you, and our buddy Lelims Marsh, and we're just mentioning that too many clean shots beating him, and that's the kind of thing where you know you can say, oh, it's the NHL, the shots are harder, they can pick their spots better, et cetera, et cetera, but. If you're a goalie and you're seeing those and they're constantly beating you clean and uh, TSN put up that graphic of how many, I think it was 46% of his goals were beating him high glove. That's where it's like, okay, maybe this is too much for you too soon. And again, that's not on Mad Sogard. It is, it was too much too soon. And he just, he had to handle it. And the Ottawa management is just like, we're sorry, kid. We, we don't have anything else to do. Um so from that perspective, like I give him a lot of leeway. I think if I was to give him a grade, Ross, I'd give him a C plus uh, just because I think the situation was tough and he had ups and downs. He had some really bad games. He had some really great games. There wasn't a whole lot of consistency in there, at least especially during the end when games mattered the most. So for me, I'd give Mad Sogard a C plus, but I don't want people to think I'm down on him or anything like that. It's just, it's a lot. For a young goalie like that uh, to take on, I'd love to argue with you, but I'm right on the same page. I think C plus is is fair because yeah, there were some games where you're like, ah, but then other games where you're like, wow, he's ahead of schedule. This is unbelievable. And I I just think the future is so bright for Mad Sogard and an off season now with all this video too that he can work on and look back at and like, yep. what do they say? And I think it's more of an NFL thing because guys switch teams so much. The guys who are like on the bubble, but it's like he's got tape now. Right. Yeah. Like you can go back like he's got all this footage and it's like, OK, now I know what it's like to play against Sidney Crosby and have these guys coming at you. I know how Matthews is going to attack off the rush. I understand that Marner's going to look to pass and that, you know, Montreal has nobody. So I'm just going to dominate them. But no, in all seriousness, I really think that even though it sucked and if they had a one a goalie, would they have been in the playoff push right till the end? Maybe. Yeah. But I also think that you're looking at a guy who who just fast tracked his development a little bit here. As long as he understands. And I just want Mads, if you're listening, buddy, don't be so hard on yourself. Don't, like I know it's easier said than done, but nobody's blaming you on every single goal. Like no. it's all good. Just shake it off and I trust the ability that he has because he's got a ton of it and he showed it time and time again this year against good teams that he can win games. It's just the NHL is a tough league for a reason. It's about doing the same thing every single night. So now he's 22 and has 21 NHL games. If you add the two that he played last season, so I just think that next year we're gonna we're gonna really see. Hopefully, like my goals for Matt Sogard, and I want yours after AHL All Star Game and in the competition for best goalie in the American Hockey League. I don't want to see him in the NHL full time. Yep. I want to see. Even like an Antoine Bebo or someone like that, like I, I want them to be like the call up goalie 
where it's like just mads focus this full year Agreed. you got your taste full year in the ahl and then let's hit the ground running you could even be the starter the year after that in the nhl yeah, it's possible. I wouldn't go so far as that, but definitely it's possible, Ross. And yeah, I think, look, you you look at all three goalies we just went over. He had the best fan grade voting. The fans believe in Mad Sogard and they support him. So it's clear that he Brady isn't the only one that sees this guy as a future goalie of the future. And neither are we. A lot of people have a lot of um, hopes and expectations and believe in the potential of a big goalie like that, that uh, has shown that in s- small spurts, he can be that guy. I just, I agree with you. I think being the number one guy in Belleville for a season will do a whole lot of good for him. All right. So that's three goalies. Pillsy, the sends you seven. Do you want a quick, Quick thought on on the other guys here. Okay, yes. I was hoping uh, after we did our full uh, segments on them, we would give some shout-outs to the other goalies because, my God, seven goalies in one year. We're a hashtag goalie-friendly show, so we'll we'll spread the wealth around. We love that. But I guess we'll go in chronological order of appearance here, or how do you want to do this? Obviously, you want to start with Magnus Helberg. Yeah, yeah. Magnus Helberg was just a fun story. He comes in for one game for the Ottawa Senators and gets the win up against Dallas. And the kit, Ross, the kit was absolutely filthy. Like, it's such a shame this guy only got to wear them in one game, Ross. I even petitioned when uh, the Sens did their home, their back-to-back home games against Detroit that Helberg wear his Sens kit as a Red Wing just so we could see it on the ice one more time. But, yeah. It's uh, that, and you talked about it. You said I would prefer maybe if a, a Antoine Bebo type guy would get the call ups instead of Mads. Well, they had Helberg, a guy just like that, but they couldn't. You can't keep three goalies, and I mean, it, it was a fun story and it worked out in a one game sample size. But it's not like he was an all star for the Red Wings the rest of the way. I know. I know you're going to get to that. Well, I was just going to say, Mad Sogard's eight eighty nine save percentage was point zero zero one better than <laughs> Helberg. Yeah. So he had a sick kit for the Red Wings too, and it's probably as clean okay. as it was when he got him. <laughs> yeah. Um, another kind of just random aside is Anton Forsberg had a point zero zero one save percentage worse than Craig Anderson. So that's just a little comparable for you folks at home. Um, yeah, Magnus Helberg, great story, stole the chain, and uh, and away he goes. And ran off with it, yeah. <laughs> off into the sunset. Um, now chronologically, I'm I'm starting to get in trouble because I don't know. Who went first? It would have been Mando next, right? Yes, Mando. Mando, still in the playoffs, by the way. Kicking out saves for the Allen Americans. So can we really do a season in review? Guy's still going. No, I guess we can't. Yeah, and uh, we love our guy Mando. He's a friend of the show, a great Great kid. Uh, Yeah, we had his dad on the show as well. Uh, That was a lot of fun after his first NHL game, first NHL win also. Not a big deal. Um, But yeah, Mando was put in a tough spot here too. He goes from playing in the ECHL, a couple games in the AHL, and now, hey kid, we need you to back up in the NHL for a stretch here. But he proved that, hey, that's another goalie with size. Mando and uh, Sogard, two two massive goalies and uh, young goalies at that. But they showed that it's it's worth uh, giving them a little taste because they had some good games, especially Mando. Like Mando's debut against against uh, New York on Long Island. 46. And getting the shootout win, man, it was incredible. So it was a great story. And uh, we're very intrigued to see what's next for Kevin Mandelese. I think he's in a very interesting spot. Yeah, he's only got three games under his belt at the NHL level. Had that win and then a tough, tough second half of back-to-back on the road in Boston. Yeah, that's just throwing him to the Wolves there, or to the Bruins, I guess. Well, yeah, to the Bears. Yeah. I mean, he lets in three goals on tw- on 32 shots. Still fine. Yeah. Everybody was bad on the West Coast trip. So that game against Calgary, I just flushed that down, and away we go. But speaking of being thrown to, uh, to an animal... Not that penguins are going to hurt you the way a bear would, but uh, that was Dylan Ferguson's welcome to the NHL moment. And he didn't make 46 saves, Pelzi. He won up, did two up, did he got 48 in his NHL debut? Yeah, Dylan Ferguson, what a story that was. I mean, uh, this is a guy who was on an NHL roster while he was still in junior with the Vegas Golden Knights when he was playing in Kamloops. And then it takes uh, quite a while for him to get another chance to get near an NHL start. And he does that. And I think it's really interesting that he's got a guy like Pete Fry, uh, a mental skill set coach that helps him along because 
goaltending, you're out there on your own. You're on an island. In, you're on that blue island in your crease. And your success or failures, ultimately, it all comes down to you. Sure, defense can play well. Uh, other teams' opponents can play well, et cetera, et cetera. But you're out there on your own. And you need to be confident. And you need to have your mental game proper. And he did look very good up against the Pittsburgh Penguins in that game. That's for sure. Yeah, he looked okay in his other game, too. 30 saves yeah. against the Devils. Allowed four goals, though, and they lost 5-3 in his other game. All right, finally, Levy, Marilinen. Two games. One was fantastic. One was awful. Yeah, I mean, I mean, again, this is a guy that's getting thrown in there, and uh, he didn't have a whole lot of uh, time to prepare. And uh, But this is, a guy, this is a guy as well. Very young, and I'm not going to say 20. goalie. Yeah, so 20. young. I'm not going to say goalie of the future, but... This guy was an absolute stud in Liga, setting a record for shutouts. He's uh, he's the guy, mano a mano, like penalty shots, breakaway shootouts. His record is absolutely insane. And he got a little, a little nibble of what the NHL is like. And I think in an ideal world, he's battling for a backup position in Belleville up against Mando next season. Lots of intrigue. When it comes to the offseason with the goaltending in Ottawa, are they going to bring in an outside guy or are one of these seven going to grab the bull by the horns? One of these six, because we know Cam Talbot is not coming back. See ya. And what happens from here? Let us know in the comments if there's a goalie that you want us to focus on when we turn our attention after these exit interviews to the offseason, free agency, trades, all that. Are there goalies that are impressing you? Who should the Senators look to bring in to stabilize the position for what is a very important next season? Pilsy, any final thoughts before we go? Yeah, final thoughts for me is I thought we could spend a little time doing Alex Dabrinkit trade proposals. Uh, I've got a lot of really good ones loaded up here that I think everyone's going to like. Yeah, I mean, your one with Tony D'Angelo, Brendan Lemieux, and Kevin Hayes' contract, I thought was just- And a first, and a first. Okay, okay. And, and two seconds and a third? Yeah. Fourth and fifth, the Tanner Janot special. No, all jokes aside, you're an idiot for that one. For Brandon Piller, I'm Ross Levitt, and this has been the Locked On Senators Podcast. Your team every day. <laughs>